Hello, everyone. Okay, my name is Karsten. I start the, uh, the talks, the scientific part of the uh, Science for Cocktails today. And we're going to talk about uh, securing digital democracy. The first thing I would like to kind of uh, bring to your attention is like uh, the world is actually undergoing a lot of changes right now. More and more countries in the world, in the African continent and everywhere else, the Arab Spring, just to mention, many more countries are thinking about using um, or building up democratic processes in order to kind of become young and uh, flourishing democracies. On the other hand, also lots of established democracies are uh, thinking about using technology in order to kind of uh, change the way how we do elections. And so all but in 2012, all but 11 countries held national elections. Okay, and so now what is actually the, the most important part? If you are a uh, young country and you'd like to kind of become a democracy, so what uh, many of them are doing is, of course, they look at information technology as a tool to kind of build good elections. And uh, elections actually are... Um, um, it's, uh, here, I should look here. Let me do it like this. Okay. So elections are um, structured. Um, they are not just the voting day activities. Elections actually start months way before an election, and they kind of continue after the voting day. And uh, we can already see that uh, in most democracies, computers and computer science and information technologies use a lot of places. So, for example, at the very end, where we tally the final result, this is where uh, information technology already plays a role. And so what I want to do today is I'm going to, first of all, talk a little bit about the last part of an election so that we get an understanding of what information technology actually can do, what algorithms design can do for us. And then I'm going to talk about the voting itself, and at the end I'm going to talk about credible elections. So let me start with the electoral system. And that is the system that um, transfers the power from us, the people, to the government. I'm not sure how many people here know how the Danish system actually works, so that's why I'm here, and I'm trying to kind of explain this to you a little bit. So here are a bunch of parties, A to I, and everyone has a couple of votes. And let's say it's the European Parliament election in Denmark, and we have 13 seats to, uh, uh, to give away. Now, who should get these 13 seats? Okay, so when you look at it, you see the party A is really, really big, the party F is a little big, but you know, you have all of the small parties. Now, how shall we do this? And, uh, you know, that was a mathematical question that uh, kept mathematicians who are interested in elections and social choice busy for a long, long time. And they came up with an algorithm which is called the Deont algorithm. And so in this algorithm, you kind of find the one with the highest and uh, you give him the seat. Okay, and then you say like, so who's the second highest? It's that guy. And now the third guy gets the third seat. Now who's supposed to get the fourth seat? No? And now what these mathematicians came up with, they said like, hey, you know, party A, I give you two seats uh, for 1,100 ballots, um, you know, if, you, uh, if 1,100 is the, is the highest number. And it is, and so actually the party uh, A gets two seats. And now the next one, uh, we can already see, is uh, 750. He gets it for the price of one. Then comes this guy, he says, like, you know, you have 740 as a third, so, you know, give me a third. Uh, th th your, your ballots actually count three seats, and so on and so forth. And when you do this over a long time, you kind of assign all of the 13 seats, and you finally come up with the winner of the election. Okay. So that's the algorithm that we're using in Denmark here. Now, the question is, why is that? Is that a good algorithm? Are we happy with this result? Could we do it differently? There are obviously computers computing all the divisions and the less thans and so on. So that's all done in Denmark Statistique. And, uh, but now we would like to kind of know and we ask the question, how do we get here and uh, what, uh, what does information technology actually has to do with this? And in order to understand this, we have to go back. We have to go back in history to a person who is the Marquis de Condorcet, who lived from 1743 to 1794, and he lived during the French Revolution. He was extremely upset that all of his friends got killed by some comedy that obviously made wrong decisions. 
And so he came up with this theory of, hey, obviously, you know, there, there must be a mathematical theory because my friends are all good and now they're all dead. So what is that theory like by, by which we kind of understand what actually good elections are and what are they not? And after Condorcet, he's basically the, the father of social choice theory. And the, he is the one who kind of came up with all of these different mathematical theories. And uh, he kind of basically, I think, I'm convinced that because of him, we have preferential voting like that's used in single transferable vote, like in countries like Australia or Ireland. And we have first past the vote voting where we only put one X on the piece of paper as it's uh, done in the States. Or we even have propor proportional schemes. But he did something else. He basically analyzed and said, like, you know, voting, you know, that we actually have different properties. So, for example, the majority, the guy who gets the first preference is most of them, he should win. Okay? So, uh, majority. Monotonicity is another property which is interesting. That is, if I kind of uh, give a vote from somebody who has uh, more votes to somebody who has less, then the guy who had more, uh, uh, the other way around, that the guy who gets more votes suddenly should not lose, right? And uh, that, unfortunately, is a property that uh, certain single transferable systems don't have anymore. So in uh, even the German election system, when somebody gets more vote, unfortunately, might lose a seat. And these are all kind of things that are a bit worrisome. And mathematically, because it's also a science talk, I should tell you that there are certain impossibility results. You can't have all. You have to make a compromise between what you can have and uh, what there is. Okay, so here's a, a long, big list of all of the different voting schemes. Uh, where's the laser? Yeah. Okay, so here, these are different uh, schemes, and these are um, properties that, unfortunately, we can't read. But it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, because you should see, it's like, red means bad, you can't have it, green means yes, it's good, okay, but you don't have a single scheme which has, like, green all the way, right? There's always a red dot in there. Okay. So what that me means is that we have different voting schemes, and that's actually an active re area of research in mathematics and economy theory. And if you're really good, you can still get Nobel Prizes in there because the 2012 Nobel Prize was actually awarded to an uh, um, economist. And, uh, you know, different countries now have to make different decisions of what is actually a good voting scheme. And you can see here there are about 260 countries in the world, 39% uh, or 85 use that. Um, some countries didn't come up with the idea that elections are a good idea. Um, some are in transition. Uh, they're in between systems, so to speak. And then we have proportional representation also a lot, right? Okay, so that means that if we understand the mathematics behind it, um, we get better. And uh, there is another thing I would like to say about Condorcet. You know, he actually came up with some really, really good preferential schemes but they are just extremely complicated to count out. It would take you 100 years to figure out who actually won an election. That is not acceptable in our time nowadays, because um, the people would like to know the very next day, after five minutes. And so over the years, after the French Revolution, you know, these electoral systems have kind of changed itself a little bit, and uh, they were streamlined so that you can actually count them out in a reasonable time. This is the, the systems we live with this, uh, right now. In the future, uh, we will actually have an innovation that is going on in electoral systems. And I have here actually two examples. One is called the double Puckelsheim. It's actually uh, Professor Puckelsheim is a German professor in Augsburg who is doing this. And for Zurich, he came up with a new electoral system. Okay, and then they implemented it, and it seems to kind of uh, prefer small parties over big parties. In Germany, where you had this negative vote weight, which is like one of those things that uh, uh, would take away seats from somebody who got more votes, um, there was a, uh, actually a Supreme Court decision that said they had to fix the uh, electoral code. Things are changing. And uh, now things are changing in a way that because we have computers, we can actually kind of go back and we can build really, really good voting systems. Okay. So this is what I wanted to say about the, the, the last part. Second part is I'd like to talk about voting itself. So that is the thing that we actually as citizens are mostly um, concerned with. Now the funny thing about voting and uh, these things and elections like, okay, you know, it's actually kind of a boring topic. We go every four years, we make a cross on a piece of paper. How complicated, how exciting can that really be? Turns out when you open up the box, it gets really, really exciting. Because nowadays, um, many countries, including Denmark, has tried in 2012, 2013 to change the law 
to actually allow electronic voting machines. And that law proposal was called L132, and uh, the, here's the law proposal, but I'm f and it, it was actually just meant to kind of allow computers in the polling station, right? So that is to kind of make sure that the uh, rough count and the fine count um, are, can be done electronically, which is more reliable, faster, and blah, blah, blah. And it did not, it did not purposefully did not uh, endorse any kind of internet elections because the ministry in Denmark uh, thought the secrecy of the vote is something that we really need to protect. And how good can an online pro uh, internet voting system actually be? Can we guarantee that the online vote has the same kind of standard as, um, as a paper vote? The law didn't get a, uh, um, a majority in uh, Parliament, and so the law was turned down in 2013, and uh, it didn't come to pass, and this is why in the next election, which whoever knows when it takes place in Denmark, um, is going to be an election with paper and a piece of pencil. Okay. Now, if you think about these online elections, what is so difficult about them? Yeah, what is so difficult about them that on the one hand side, you'd like to guarantee the integrity of the election? You want to make sure that nobody cheated. You want to make sure that no attacker has kind of dialed themselves into some internet node and changed all of the ballots. And on the other hand, right, we want to make sure that the secrecy of the ballot is actually guaranteed. And that is extremely important, not just for Denmark, but you know, for other countries which might not have such a great record of human rights uh, um, as, as the Western world. And so secrecy and integrity of the world, they're like two magnetic poles, right? They're repelling each other. And now we still have, when we have to build an internet voting system, we have to make one system that actually does both. Okay, so let me explain to you who actually uses internet voting systems. There are a few, okay? So in Canada, for example, they use internet voting. Mexico, small Panama also has internet voting. Australia and the state of New South Wales uses internet voting. Armenia. Switzerland, and Switzerland is a democ direct democracy. They, count, they have to vote several times a year, so for them, it's, uh, they, they clearly look into this. France is using it. Estonia is one of the, uh, the first countries to have ever tried it in 2005 for binding elections, and up to today, about 30% of all people actually vote online. Okay. So these are the, uh, that's the slide about the internet elections. Okay. Now, you've seen that's not very many countries, considering that all of the other countries also have internet, right? Um, so, there are things going on in the background, namely that countries are actually looking into introducing um, internet voting as an additional voting channel. Okay, so part of the reasons is because of geographic challenges. So, Norway tried for the last 2011-2013 uh, election, they piloted a system, and you know, Norway is a Scandinavian country, but it's much longer than Denmark, and it's much more complicated to put in uh, uh, all over the place voting places, right? So they're looking into this, but it has been turned down. This is why on this slide, um, Norway is, uh, is not colored, okay. Um, there's a certain hope for increased voter turnout, although there is no evidence that this is actually the case. Um, there's a lot of talk about cost savings. So I attended uh, the uh, Estonian election uh, last year, and uh, there was actually clear arguments, you know, we are saving a lot of money by, by actually running internet voting. And if you have 30% of all of the people uh, voting over the internet, we can afford many fewer people in the polling stations, right? Okay, so what is the, what's the message that uh, one has to kind of uh, take seriously if one is an electoral management body? And that is, the electoral man management bodies, they're actually very much used to kind of handle risks. Now, elections are differently from paper deadlines, where you can always ask for a few days extension if you couldn't finish your paper. Elections actually take place at a certain day, at a certain hour, and that's it. That's a hard deadline, right? And you have to work towards it. You have to hire helpers. In Denmark, it's three weeks. You have to hire all of the election hel helpers. You have to order all of the materials. What is if it doesn't show up? What is if you don't have seals or ballot boxes like in Egypt? What is if a natural disaster strikes like in uh, the last US midterm election and uh, there was a, a hurricane going by uh, uh, New Jersey and then they were like a bit concerned that the electronic voting machines don't have enough power uh, to actually receive votes. But you know, that's, that's, these are risks that, that uh, EMBs are actually very much used to kind of handling. But if you kind of really look at technology, there are additional risks. Namely, you have to worry about adversaries. 
So is there a country, for example, a nation state that is against you, that would like to tamper with your election? Do you defend? How do you defend? That's why it's a cybersecurity issue, right? There could be software bugs, hardware bugs. Uh, things uh, explode if you don't do things right. Actually, today I just saw in a newspaper that the Airbus crashed because of a software mistake. Um, these are tragic uh, things. There are single points of failures that what introduces. One has to kind of be uh, ready to introduce fallback positions. And the most important part of this is an electoral management body is responsible for the election, no matter who the vendor is who actually provided the technology. Okay. Now, many have tried, and that's why it's a good question to ask is what could go wrong? Okay. Things have gone wrong, and I have some examples here, but I'm very glad that Alex Haldeman is here, who is actually the world specialist in showing governments what's wrong. Um, so we'll talk next. So once I shut up, then it's his turn. Okay, so here just a few things. Digital, uh, in the New South Wales election this year, they forgot to display a certain box on the uh, internet ballot form which uh, voters complained about and then they fixed it, but at the end the race was so close between the animal rights or animal justice party and some other party, so that it was actually at the end a course case if they have to redo the entire election. Okay. No entropy in Norway, there was a, um, a small bug in the uh, JavaScript client which people downloaded to their computers before they wanted to vote, and that uh, entropy actually makes things random. Unfortunately, it didn't, was not as random as it should have been because everyone got the same randomness, or 60% got the same randomness, and so at the end, the secret ballots were not a secret because the encrypted version looked all pretty similar. Configuration problems in Kenya, um, they kind of uh, secured, uh, they procured a system, you know, one should understand that in uh, Kenya, they don't normally have the most peaceful elections. Um, so there was, in the election in 2008 or so, uh, 1,500 people died because uh, there was some rumor that things didn't go right and uh, you know, people started killing one another. So they decided to uh, bet on electronic uh, technology and they procured a system with mobile phones and a database that has to run, that collects then all of the, uh, the, the mobile phones were used to kind of transfer uh, polling data from the polling stations to the uh, electoral management uh, body, to the electoral commission. But unfortunately, when they created the database, they created it on the C drive, not on the D drive. And the C drive, uh, some of you who study computer science might know, is not very big because that's where the system lives. And when they wanted to know the result of the election, they noticed that the database was empty. And unfortunately, they didn't have enough information. It took them weeks to reconstruct what was actually going on. Okay. Now, I started this, this segment here with talking about integrity and secrecy. So we have to do something in order to bring things together. Okay. And I, since it's a science talk, so here's a bit of a scientific slide. Here is a, uh, here is a way how many people think about this in the cryptographic community of how this could be done. And the technique I show you here is actually used also in the Tor network. It's called onion routing. Okay. And so the idea is you, you want to kind of make sure that when you as a voter submit your encrypted ballot to the, to the place, that nobody can trace back where it actually came from. And the cryptographic way to doing this is the following. You have three computers which are called mixing computers, and each one of these mixing computers gives us a key in red, blue, and green. Okay. And now the voters are asked to kind of encrypt their, their ballots in the following way. First, you encrypt it with the green thing, then you encrypt it with the blue key, and then you encrypt it with the uh, red key. And you can really think about this as keys if you're not a cryptographer. Um, okay, so now you have that, and now when you want to start the mixing, right? And now we all know that, aha, this guy lives at the address one, yeah, this must be Karsten, okay? This is B, that's Alex, and then C is J, and then D is somebody else, okay? And so when we kind of uh, push this in here, we give it to the first computer, he decrypts it, and then he shuffles it somehow, okay? And then he kind of pushes it to the next computer, this guy shuffles and pushes it to the next computer, and this guy shuffles, and out comes the result. Now the point is, if there's one of those guys honest, then we know that it's actually correctly shuffled. Okay. And this kind of techniques has been used, for example, in the elections in Norway. Okay, so this is, the, uh, this is the idea, and you know, there's a lot of mass behind all of this. There is elliptic curve cryptography, you have to be careful which curve to use. Uh, I don't think I can go into here because I don't have so much time, but it's exciting stuff. Okay, now let me, uh, let me finish. Uh, so, 
uh, finish my talk with the following observation. Now you have all of this crypto stuff, right? These things are encrypting stuff and re-encrypting. Now one of these guys could be dishonest, right? And just kind of encrypts the, uh, all of the ballots for the favorite party. And out comes all A's or all B's, okay? So that means that we have to trust the election, okay? And that brings me to the last topic I want to talk about is credible elections, okay? By the Convention of Human Rights, Article 21.3, Okay, I'm not sure if you all read your homework for today, so I read it for you. The will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. This shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections. Okay, genuine. Which shall be universal and equal suffrage. That means that uh, everyone is allowed to vote and everyone has a fair access to the election. And shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent free voting procedures. Okay. So credible elections, so one used to speak about free and fair elections but this has come a little bit out of vogue. So the key term is to have credible elections where you can really believe the outcome. And credible elections are important because this is how trust is generated among the population. Okay. Now, in order to kind of have this human rights actually been implemented, you need to have the uh, order, security, and the rule of law. These are basically the preconditions. I'm not a political scientist, but uh, these are the preconditions for that. And I went... Uh, in 2011, to, uh, um, actually I was an election, a guest of the High Election Commission in Egypt. That was the first free election in, in Egypt. And we took this picture here, and you can actually see the security. So here's a, uh, uh, you know, the, the gun clearly indicates this military stuff going on here. But it's also the rule of law. Because in order to kind of have a credible election, you have to have trust in someone. And in Egypt, one was chosen, I'm sorry, here, one, was, uh, one actually kind of picked judges to be the people who are responsible for the ballot box. So from the time when the ballot was put into the box all the way to the end of the election, um, judges were a part of it. So rule of law and order and security is pretty well established here. Okay, so now this is actually a picture that shows the transfer of ballots from ballot stations to the counting place. Okay, now let's look at Norway 2013, where um, the ballots were also transferred. Okay, you can kind of can see that there's a different, uh, a different uh, background for all of this, right? Okay, we have of course order, we have security, we have human rights, we have all of those things. But you know, in this little black box, there was a USB stick, a little USB stick with all of the ballots that were encrypted that actually contained the information about the voters and that they were then in inserted in these kind of computers here and then these girls did their magic and here's uh, Christian Bull who was responsible for the elections in Norway and they're back there you can't see there's a blender with which they kind of destroyed, they really literally destroyed the USB stick with uh, personal information by shredding it into pieces. It was one minute and it smelled like burnt rubber everywhere. But then you also see, you see these, oh, you see the, uh, you see this, this blue screen here. There were people actually kind of overlooking the, or you know, controlling basically the decryption process. And so this entire process was generated and or organized and, or architected in such a way that this mixnet, which I just showed you, actually provides evidence that it did the right thing. And that evidence is something that is some, somewhat important in elections in order to kind of be trustworthy. Because otherwise we just have a computer system that spits some numbers out at the end, and that is not good enough. And you kind of see this, this little person here in white, who actually kind of took pictures of the screen to kind of, uh, these were hash values, uh, you know, uh, two, uh, yeah, SHA-256 uh, yeah, hash uh, values, and he compared them. And when he nodded, everyone said, like, okay, we believe it. So far, so good. The counting process, delivering of the ballots has been, uh, has been done. But if you compare it to the uh, uh, Egyptian election, there's a huge difference between the two. Okay. Now, one of the things that we need is therefore verifiability. And verifiability is uh, something where we as, uh, as uh, you know, individuals can convince ourselves, or maybe the, the, the entire country and the entire population can convince ourselves that an internet voting system did actually the right thing. And there are different ways to produce this kind of evidence. We have just seen the cryptographic one. These are called zero-knowledge proofs, so you can Google them. It's actually kind of really not so difficult to understand what they are, and they're really, really cool. Um, there are logical ones, which are too complicated to talk to here because I have to give uh, time to Alex. 
And then there are statistical ones, where you basically kind of just take samples. And the interesting part about the statistical one is that we actually did it in Denmark for the last election for the European Parliament. And uh, what we wanted to know, because in the law proposal L132 I just talked about, there is a, a little line that says, in order to kind of make sure that the election went correctly, we'll have to check Stickbrüers. We have to kind of take samples and check them. Yeah, but how big are the samples? Can we actually get them? Where do they come from? Who checks them? And so on and so forth. So we did an experiment, and we wanted to be 99.9% .9 sure with the theory that Philip Stark uh, developed, and uh, we, we computed that we had to audit 1,903 ballots. So that's actually kind of interesting. So if you take 19 or 3 ballots, you can be sure that this kind of crazy Dion thing that we showed at the beginning actually computed the right result with a confidence interval of 99.9%. Uh, .9%. So we can be extremely happy. And then when it says yes or no, and for the referendum last year, there was only 60 ballots. Okay. So my conclusion is that, uh, obviously I'm excited about this, so, uh, so it is an exciting area. It actually kind of brings together mathematics from uh, um, social choice. It brings together computer security and cyber security. It brings together cryptography and programming languages, and it also brings together social s uh, science, political science, uh, statistics, and all of those fields. And that is just a very, very simple problem that is extremely difficult to solve, and we don't have a good solution for it. And this is why I think, and I end with the topic here, science, we need something like electoral science. We need to understand how to innovate these electoral systems. We have to kind of uh, understand how internet elections can actually work in a post-Snowden age. Okay, we have to kind of educate future generation of experts that kind of help the world establishing democracies that are credible. And we have to understand the notion of trust in these different contexts, in these different cultures, in these different backgrounds. And this is what we think we have to do in order to secure digital democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Karsten, my friend. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Halderman. Uh, I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Michigan. And um, uh, assuming that the trustees of the University of Michigan don't find about, out about this talk, I, I hope to get tenure on Thursday. So uh, <laughs> please don't tell them, uh, especially about the introduction. <laughs> uh, so um, most of my time I spend trying to secure the fundamental protocols behind uh, internet security, things like SSH and HTTPS. Um, but a substantial part of my free time, I spend uh, studying the security of electronic voting and internet voting because, well, it's important and hacking computers is fun. Um, <laughs> But uh, so this talk, I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about the experience that we've had around the world with uh, internet voting systems and a bit about why voting online with the technology we have today uh, is very, very hard to secure. Um, this talk is going to be based on joint work with uh, about 10 different co-authors. I'd like to especially thank my students, uh, Drew, Travis, Scott, Eric, and, uh, and Travis. Yes, I remember all my students. <laughs> so why is voting a difficult security problem? Well, if you think about things we can do well today with internet security, things like banking online, things like um, shopping on Amazon.com, um, these are problems that have a particular shape. They're problems where um, we can do a financial transaction where we know who the parties are, we know the amount of the transaction, and at the end of the day, we can send you a receipt. The bank has a ledger that shows where the money came from and where it went, and you can check your account at the end of the month to make sure it has the right amount of money in it. And if anything goes wrong, well, we can try to reverse those transactions. But in voting, we have this tension between this problem of integrity, which is you know, that the right guy won, and this problem of ballot secrecy, which is what makes voting such a, a, a difficult, distinct problem. The secret ballot, that is that other people can't find out how you voted, well, even if you want to tell them how you voted, even if you want to prove to them, that is what protects you, that's what protects all of us against you being coerced into his voting a certain way and against you selling your vote to me because I'm the dishonest candidate who wants to pay you for your vote. These two properties, though, are intention 
because ballot secrecy means we can't just give you a receipt that says who you voted for. We can't just have some database somewhere that identifies everyone's vote. Those sort of things undermine ballot secrecy. And as a result, um, we can't use the same kind of protections that we use to protect your bank account to protect your online vote. Now, amidst that tension, we still have some of the hardest threats in computer security today standing in the way of voting online. Um, I just mentioned co coercion, but if you think about other things like just uh, phishing attacks, if you ever got uh, an, an email saying, well, I, you, we've, we've had a security breach, go to this link to change your password, guess what, it's probably a scam. Um, that's something that can be a threat to online voting just as well. Or imposter websites, right? So uh, do you know the, the website uh, for, uh, for the official voting website for your country um, by heart? Probably not. You're probably going to get it in an email or from Google, something like that. Well, just the same way, uh, if that link, if that site is incorrect, this is a, a very, very common sort of attack on other websites. Um, beyond that, the central problem of computer security today, one of the central problems, is protecting your home computer or your smartphone from malware, malicious software uh, that can try to do everything from spy on you and steal your private information um, to uh, uh, changing the behavior of software running on your computer. And if an attacker can get malware onto the device you use to cast your vote, then they can change your vote. And that's one of the fundamental risks. And we don't know how to stop malware in general. In fact, a large fraction, something like half, of all personal computers have one form or another ma of malware on them right now. There also are significant threats against the server side of an internet voting system. And when you think about it, internet voting is dangerous because you have to have a server that's online and facing the world. That's the whole point. You can't just have a server that's private and locked up and only accessible to the election officials. And we know that servers for major companies with incredible security budgets gets hacked into all the time. Systems belonging to Google, Twitter, Microsoft, Facebook have famously been hacked in recent years. Well, not only that, but the Pentagon, the White House, right? These are um, uh, places that are secured to a level that's almost unimaginable to regular companies, have also been successfully attacked remotely because their systems have to be connected to the internet to function. Beyond just remote intrusion, we have to worry about problems from insiders. And this is another one of the central problems in computer security today. If you're a system administrator, if you're one of the people running the server, you have to have special access to do your job. And how do we design a system so those people with special access nonetheless cannot defeat the security of the election? When you think about an insider attack, Edward Snowden is one of the classic examples of that. Because he was a privileged sysadmin, he was able to steal so many secrets and let all of us know about the really horrible things that my government was up to. <laughs> And speaking of my government being up to, well, state-sponsored attacks, you, you read about almost every month in the newspaper now, government on government cyber attacks. This used to be science fiction, but amazingly, it's reality today. And whether that's um, maybe North Korea hacking Sony, or uh, China hacking into US companies, or Russia hacking into, well, who knows what, or my own government hacking into basically everything. Um, <laughs> I have to say, I, I, I do believe that we are, that the U.S. right now is the most sophisticated um, originator of cyber attacks in the world. You've heard about how we hacked into the Iranian nuclear enrichment program to sabotage their centrifuges. You probably haven't heard about most of the stuff we're up to. But just one, one figure to give you an example of the scale, our budget for offensive cyber attacks is about equal to 10% of the national budget of, of Denmark. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so let me tell you, with all of these threats, how do we see how this translates into reality? And there are only a few examples of places where we've gotten as academic researchers to study internet voting systems in general, uh, in, in detail, because usually people who are running them don't let us. 
They say, well, you know, well, you're welcome to study our system if you want to go to jail. Um, uh, and so we can't ethically and legally do it. But there are a few examples, and I'm going to try to give you three of them very, very quickly. The best example we have of a realistic cyber attack on an internet voting system comes from Washington, D.C. in 2010, when Washington, D.C., the, the government of the district, decided to build an online voting system to let absentee voters participate in the national election. And um, Washington, D.C., when they decided to do this, they did a lot of things right. They made the whole system open source. They used the best web uh, site developers available. Um, they even went to the computer security research community and asked us, well, how should we build our internet voting system? Well, the research community said, wait, wait, no, don't do that. Internet voting, we don't know how to do that securely with existing technology. But D.C. decided to go forward with it anyway. And um, as sort of a way to tell these researchers to put our money where our mouths were, they decided they would open up the system to the public uh, a week early and run a mock election and say anyone in the world who wants to try to hack in and show that it can be done is welcome to do so. Well, it's not every day that you're invited to hack into government computers without going to jail. So my, my students and I couldn't resist. We took part in this challenge. <laughs> Let me tell you what we found. But first, here's really quickly, this is what the website online voting system looked like. A really nice design. So you go to a website, you log in with your name and a code you got in the mail, uh, you download a ballot, fill it out just in a PDF reader because they're going to print these out and count them with mail-in ballots. Save it, upload the ballot, and then it says, thank you for voting. Uh, tell everyone you voted on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> awesome, right? <laughs> All right, well, let's see what, what went wrong. So um, my students, Scott and Eric here, and these are two great guys there, but they're fresh out of college. None of us are professional, you know, hackers. Um, we decided we'd start by reading through the source code they published. And it's in this language called Ruby on Rails that's one of the hot website languages these days, but none of us had ever read any of it before, so it took us a few hours to go through. <laughs> But eventually, in the middle of the night, we stumbled across this one line here in the source code that caught our attention. And what the, the one in yellow here. And what the system is doing here is it's processing the ballot that the voter has uploaded. And um, it's going to encrypt it, to, uh, encrypt it with a key that's going to be kept offline somewhere. So that if anyone breaks into the system, they shouldn't be able to read the ballots that have already been voted. And to do that, it's going to pass the ballot file through a program called GPG that maybe uh, one or two geeks in the audience will know. Anyway, um, what caught our attention was right here, right? They have these pair of double quotation marks. Um, well, the programmer should have used single quotation marks there. And because they used double quotation marks instead, we were able to hack in and change all the votes. So I'm serious. So this is what happens. So when the system is processing the uploaded ballot, it's stored as a temporary file name like this, something, something, something dot PDF. That's your ballot. But the system, the way it's designed, because of the, the way this particular library works, um, the, the extension on the file that identifies the type is preserved. It's exactly whatever the user uploaded. If it's ballot.xyz, it'll be some random name.xyz. And in fact, it's quite literally preserved. If I upload a ballot with some crazy name like this, the system will process it like that, with the same name. But it turns out that the way Linux computers, something called the bash shell, process file names, if you use this special construction with a dollar sign and some parentheses, then whatever is inside those parentheses gets executed as a command on the server. The double quotation marks allow that to go through, and single quotes would have stopped it. So when we uploaded a ballot like this, this was our actual test, we noticed that the server rejected it. It wasn't a PDF file, but it took five seconds longer than normal because that sleep five command ran first. That's when we knew we were going to get in and change all the votes. 
So we spent a lot of other time going through the, the design of their network, too. They told us these IP addresses are part of the online voting system. And so we scanned them with all kinds of different hacking and probing tools and discovered a lot of really neat things on their network that would have also given us a way to get in and change votes. But one really interesting thing we found online was some video cameras in their server room that happened not to be password protected, that were just sitting there online. So that let us see, I don't know, here are the, the servers running the election, here's some guy installing new hardware for the election, here's the security guard, he can't tell by looking that we've hacked in. And really though, this was particularly interesting because as attackers, and we were getting into this mindset, we were thinking, how would we think about this if we were the real bad guys hacking the real election? Well, this gave us a way to tell whether we had been caught whether they were on to us. And eventually, when they did finally find out what we had done, um, you know, they weren't calm anymore. Uh, they were none too pleased. <laughs> but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, so let's, let's rewind here and go to the actual attack. So, um, when we actually attacked the system, um, we waited until after five o'clock when we could tell from the security cameras that the system administrators went home for the night because we didn't want anyone just you know looking over our shoulders so to speak and then we started to use this quotation mark command execution vulnerability what's called a, a, sh a, a shell injection attack to execute our own commands on the server so the first thing we did what do you think the first thing we did was Change all the votes? No, actually, the first thing we did, like a real attacker, was steal everything we could that could possibly help us get back into the system if we were caught and kicked out. Right From that point forward, the system would never be as secure again because we had taken these different pieces of information that would help us get back in. The second thing we did was change all the votes. <laughs> So we actually replaced them with, uh, do I have the PDF here? We replaced them with write-in ballots where every candidate was some evil robot or AI from sci-fi and the movies, HAL 9000 for president and Bender for school board and so forth. <laughs> Whoever the computer would have elected. After that, we rigged the system to replace any subsequent votes with our slate of evil robots. Um, and we added a back door by changing the code that would let us know, basically send us a message every time someone voted with who they voted for and who they were. <laughs> Finally, we tried to clear the logs, erase all the traces that we were there, and we actually it would have been pretty hard for them to figure out who had done it. But we decided we, we had a little bit of a problem. We wanted to get some more scientific data out of this experiment because, well, frankly, one of the most interesting questions would be how can election administrators detect and respond to an attack like this? There's never been a comparable thing where uh, the good guys had hacked into the system and the, the uh, election officials didn't know it. Um, so we wanted them to find out but the real election was only about a week away, and they wouldn't have found this out until they had counted the ballots from the mock election. So we did one more thing. We left a calling card in hopes that they would find out. So what we did was we changed that page that thanked you for voting and added just a few lines of source code here. What this does is after a voter votes, after a delay of a few seconds, their computer will start playing the University of Michigan football fight song, Hail to the Victors. <laughs> Nevertheless, it was two days before Washington, D.C. officials found out anything was wrong, and that's only when someone else emailed them, someone else testing the system emailed to say, well, it all looks pretty good to me, but I don't like the music that plays at the end. It's too distracting. <laughs> So DC made a very logical choice. They decided not to use the online ballot return system for the actual election. Instead, what they did is let voters download a blank ballot, print it out, and mail it back. So the postal system, all of that is not perfect, but it has the property that three guys at the University of Michigan, hundreds of miles away, can't hack in and change the outcome of the election. And that, I think, is one of the properties that all of us can agree we want in a voting system. 
So let me uh, tell you about Estonia next, and I'm going to try to do this very, very quickly. And I know you're uh, probably all interested in, in Estonia's voting system, which is you know, one of the most significant voting systems in the world. I always have to show this slide for the American audience who thinks <laughs> Estonia is, I, I don't know, in, uh, in South America somewhere. Um, <laughs> But Estonia, it turns out, is the world's largest, most significant user of internet voting. A third of all ballots in the last election, uh, even newer than this, were cast online. But are those votes secure? Right? So countries around the world, including mine, look to this and say, well, why aren't we voting online, Estonia? Um, <laughs> But really, is Estonia's system secure? Nobody uh, ha independent of the government had ever done a rigorous security review. So I decided to get together a team of people um, last year and actually go to Estonia and do such a study. And um, we became official accredited election observers, got to watch the servers and the operation in the data centers during the election, got to interview all the key people, people like Tarvi Martins, the, uh, the sort of father of the system. Um, we even got to look through uh, parts of the source code. About half of the source code is available publicly. And also to study uh, tens of hours of YouTube videos of their entire procedure, which they post online during the election. And based on this, we did the first rigorous independent security review. So here's how voting works in Estonia. You, uh, it looks like a normal laptop, except for this thing down here. This is a card reader for the national ID cards, which are, have a, a chip in them, like your bank card, that contains some crypto keys. And every Estonian's national ID has one of these, and they interface with that into the voting system. So to vote, they download a piece of software that's published before every election, and basically use their card to log in, walk through steps in this program, and it goes through some complicated encryption you can read about in, the pa in our paper. Afterwards, you see a code on your screen, a barcode like that, which you can scan in with your mobile phone, and it independently checks that the server received the proper vote. That's called the verification system. Finally, at the end of the day, um, after the election, all of the votes which were encrypted with your national ID card um, are going to be basically split up from the signatures, just like a double envelope paper ballot, and uh, counted by a special computer at the election headquarters, which is kept offline until the end of the election, and is the only thing that has the key to decrypt those ballots. All right, so what could go wrong? So Estonia has been the victim of various attacks over the years, various cyber attacks, um, uh, including um, uh, things back in about, uh, about seven years ago where um, attackers linked to Russia did some of the largest ever denial of service attacks against Estonia to try to bring down lots of their critical government systems. I'm sure that would never happen again. Also, in Ukraine last summer, they had an election. It wasn't online voting, but it was an, a, a computer-controlled counting process where uh, results from all over the country were added up by central systems uh, that were in a computer network. And attackers, uh, also linked to Russia, reportedly hacked into these systems to try to disrupt the election and change the results. But I'm sure none of this applies to Estonia's voting system, right? <laughs> Actually, there are two systems of, in, uh, two components of Estonia's voting system that are potentially susceptible to the same kinds of attacks. These are pieces that are what are called trusted components. And in security, when we say something is trusted, what we, what we mean is that if anything goes wrong with it, we're totally screwed. <laughs> that's, what, that's the definition of trusted. And those are the voter's client and the central counting server. So we demonstrated in this research study um, attacks against both of those components. So against your home computer, we demonstrated that um, uh, we could construct malicious software that if delivered to your computer by pre-existing malware, that's a, uh, malware already on your computer is actually available for rent on the black market. I can just go to the right website and rent out for uh, pennies a day infected computers in whatever country I want. And I can use that it turns out, to deliver software to Estonia's voting computer, Estonia voters' computers um, that can silently steal the information from their national ID cards that's necessary to change the votes. 
So we solved the problems associated with this and demonstrated in a laboratory replica of this system how this could work. But that means you have to get the software to voters' computers. It would probably be easier, especially for a state-level attacker, like, say, the Kremlin or the NSA, um, to just attack the central counting server, the place that actually decrypts the ballots and outputs the election results. That's the only place in the system that ever gets to see the proper ballot that you voted. Now, it's kept offline, so infecting it with malware is slightly non-trivial. But it turns out this is what, say, NSA and other intelligence agencies specialize in, is attacking these sorts of air gap systems. This is exactly how we attack the Iranian nuclear enrichment program. And uh, one way to do this, which we demonstrated in the lab, involves infecting another system that's used to actually set up all of the software on this counting server and uh, infect it because it's not secured and then uh, through that infect the software that gets installed on the counting server. And we demonstrate the technical details about this in the lab and in the paper. Okay, but both of these attacks involve to a certain extent breaches of the operational security of the Estonian system, right? We have to somehow compromise pieces of the system in order to get to the right place to change the votes. So assuming they have absolutely fantastic operational security, maybe these won't work. And indeed, the president of Estonia declares that their security is better than Google's. <laughs> All right, well, to find out whether their security was better than Google's, um, one of my students, Drew Springle, watched frame by frame those YouTube videos I mentioned that, they, that show the server operations during the election. And he found some interesting things. All right, so here's an e example. Um, this is uh, the room where they're setting up all of the servers before the election. All right, and uh, here, for instance, this is uh, Tarvi Martins, the father of the system. Here on the wall behind them is him is the uh, password for their Wi-Fi network that they're using to do all of this. <laughs> all right, here's uh, one of the other uh, election officials setting up the servers. And interesting what's on the screen here behind him. Let's zoom in. Um, Okay, it's a Windows computer, and here we have some websites they're visiting. Oh, apparently they're downloading some freeware programs from the web to set things up. Oh, and they're coming from non-secure URLs, so uh, an attacker who's uh, attacking their network can insert malware while they're downloading them. All right. Okay, maybe, maybe this is more interesting. Here's a later step. Here they're building that voting software. They're setting up the voting software uh, for download by everyone in the country. All right, uh, here's the, this is one screen from the software. Hmm, what's this? There are a lot of icons on the desktop here. Uh, I'll zoom in a little bit. What, there's poker stars. Uh, here's a BitTorrent client. Here's some pirated music. It looks like this is someone's personal laptop. This isn't some highly secured system. 50% chance there's already malware on this, even if no one's trying to attack it. And yet, this is actually what they're using to digitally sign and distribute the official voting client that everyone will download. So if an attacker got into this computer, they could infect everyone in the country. Oh, here we see also later on the same computer, Tarvi's documents, Karen's arts. Looks like this is Tarvi Martin's personal laptop. <laughs> Better than Google's, huh? All right, here again, here they're logging into one of the servers. Here's what they're actually typing. It says it's the root password for the server, the master <laughs> password for the election server. You can actually see the keystrokes in the video they published during the election. Um, here's some guy typing the personal ID number for his, uh, his voting smart card. Um, oh, here later on, this is something we took in the data center during the election. Uh, you know, this is the secure cage where the actual servers are stored. Well, here's the key to get into the room where the servers live. <laughs> so it's shown in enough detail here that we can actually 3D print a replica that will work in the lock. <laughs> oh, well. Um, 
Anyway, we took these findings that, uh, you know, the state level attackers could pretty easily get into the system and that the operational security was terrible. And last summer, we published a paper, a peer reviewed study about this and uh, went to Estonia and told people about it. You might be curious about Estonia's response. Well, we had an official response, including uh, it, caught, it, it made lots of national attention uh, during, their, during their next election. Um, and uh, so even major politicians commented on this story. In fact, the, uh, so here's our paper. In fact, the Prime Minister of Estonia uh, had, had essentially this to say. <laughs> anyway, I don't think Estonia is going to change their system soon. The, the entrenched political party really loves it. They love thinking that it's a very modern way to vote. And they're extremely resistant to any, uh, uh, to any criticism of it. But I hope other countries will pay attention to the lessons here, that Estonia is not a perfect system, far from it. They're actually putting their democracy at tremendous risk. So very, very quickly, one more example. I know we're at, the, at our time. And this is just from March of this year. New South Wales, Australia, one of the Australian states, held an online election, the largest ever online election to date. They were expecting multiple hundred thousand ballots to be cast. Um, uh, uh, and it was a really interesting website system, once again, logged on with a screen like this. Um, they said it was going to be extremely safe and secure. Your vote is fully encrypted and safeguarded, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, because I, I'm, I wanted to travel to Australia and I'm interested in online voting, I decided to go in March and visit a colleague of mine there, Vanessa Teague, who had been studying elections for years, and we decided to use the week during which the voting system was going to be open to maybe take a look at its security. So what we found was that although from the outside it looked like the election server was highly secure, it uses HTTPS, it's set up correctly, all of those things are done right, um, it, like most sophisticated online applications, involved loading many different components in the background. And if you hit F12 on a Windows machine, you'll get to see all of this stuff loading. But one of the components that it loaded turned out to be this tracking software that they were loading from a third party site. Who knows why there's tracking software on an election system, but they were doing it. And um, I realized in the middle of the night one night that this might be a little bit of a problem. And when we put the tracking software website into um, a security test program, we see this, that the server actually scores a grade of F. It's vulnerable to something called the poodle attack. It's vulnerable to something called the freak attack. It's vulnerable in all sorts of other different ways. So what we showed was that this vulnerability and this third party component they were loading was enough to let us, or an attacker, say intercept connections. So here's the loading the main voting application and then it loads this 30 third party component. Well, if the network is malicious, like you're connecting from a cafe that's uh, trying to change your vote, or your home router has malware on it, as about half of them do, well, then it can execute one of these attacks to change that third party component as it's loaded and inject malicious code into the voting system on your client that we show can secretly change votes. So we did a demonstration during the actual election um, in which we showed that this was true. This is the practice version of the voting website. And uh, on our version, um, you get this guy, Ned Kelly, who's some, uh, no one outside of Australia knows who he is, but he's an outlaw figure and iconic there. And Ned Kelly pops up because our code is running on the site. But this was in the middle of a real election we discovered this. So what we did was we went to the Australian computer security authorities and alerted them and waited for the election officials to patch this problem. Um, and then we went public with it after it had been corrected. But by that time, um, by that time, um, uh, it was 2 p.m. on the Friday of election week, 66,000 votes had already been cast. Now, I certainly hope that none of them were tampered with, but because of this vulnerability, a very basic failure in web security, the system can't guarantee that they weren't. In fact, it can't give us evidence that they weren't. Many other components of the system, the source code and, and so forth, have never been publicly scrutinized. And so as a result of that, we don't know whether there are other even worse vulnerabilities still present. 
And one thing that I couldn't tell people about at the time was that there's a new vulnerability in web servers, something called the logjam attack, um, that I helped discover that's going to be announced tomorrow that we've known about for months that uh, affected this server too, um, but that we were still waiting for web browsers to fix before we went public with it. So there were multiple ways we could have breached this uh, online voting system and changed votes. So the response in Australia from uh, Ian Brightwell, the uh, guy who ran the system, was that uh, fears over the system's integrity were being fanned by well-funded, well-managed anti-internet voting lobby groups, by which I guess he means me. <laughs> well, so I don't know. I, I think this is uh, you know, a little bit of uh, a head-in-the-sand posture for election officials. So the real problem, though, you know, internet voting, what I want, I want a system where you or I, or that Tarvi Martin's guy, or Ian Brightwell in Australia, or the NSA, or Vladimir Putin can't change the vote. This is what I call a democracy, right? Major fraud with online voting has to be at least as hard as it was with paper voting, or we're not moving ahead by adopting online voting, we're taking a massive step backwards. And from my perspective as a security researcher, I think some of the largest problems in security are standing in our way. And unfortunately, for that reason, I think it might be decades, if ever, before we're able to make the advances necessary, the fundamental breakthroughs that we need to vote online securely. Thank you.